I now need to find out what Bojangles is. <laughs> I don't have those in California, but I have, I've made up a story about what that is. Uh, so in our last workshop, we learned a lot about uh, large vendors. And it appears that they will be able to adapt to food package changes fairly readily. Um, and that was reassuring to us. Given that small vendors are important to many participants, we now have a few presentations that focus on that topic. Um, I'm going to introduce all three speakers now, and then, um, but Jennifer, you'll be the first to be invited up here. So Jennifer Pelletier will address the response of small vendors to WIC stocking requirements. Dr. Pelletier is a social and behavioral epidemiologist with expertise in school and community-based obesity prevention policies. She has expertise in quantitative and qualitative research methods and has a particular interest in measuring and evaluating the activities and impacts of cross-sector partnerships for obesity prevention. She has an MPH and PhD from the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. Dr. Pelletier is currently a research scientist at the Minnesota Department of Health, where she is responsible for leading evaluation efforts on policy systems and environmental strategies to promote active living in community settings and healthy eating, physical activity in child care settings. Um, and if you aren't already, we're going to get you very connected to the Minnesota WIC people, because that will be a great strategy. Um, following then, following Dr. Pelletier, we will have co-presenters from the Food Trust. The Food Trust is a nationally recognized nonprofit headquartered in Philadelphia, dedicated to ensuring that everyone has access to affordable, nutritious food and information to make healthy decisions. Deborah Bensel serves as the Food Trust's Associate Director for Community Food Systems and leads the agency's regional food system initiatives, including farm to institution and farmers marketing programming. She provides training on technical assistance to schools and child care centers, suppliers and farmers and other groups interested in implementing or enhancing local food initiatives intended to address access to healthy foods. Deb earned her Master of Public Health degree in 2003 from Boston University and prior to joining the Food Trust, managed research projects and community programs at Fair Food Philly, that is fun to say, uh, Harvard University and the Veterans Administration. Uh, finally, Candace Young is an Associate Director for Research and Evaluation at the Food Trust. She has over 15 years of public health management, research, and program development experience. She evaluates the impact of the Food Trust's programming and leads consulting projects that provide best practices from the organization's comprehensive approach to build healthier communities. She has advised public health agencies, school systems, foundations, community groups, and food and nutrition organizations in more than 15 states on strategies to expand healthy food access. Prior to joining the Food Trust in 2008, Candace was program director of the Physical Activity and Nutrition Program at the New York City Department of Health health and mental hygiene, where she led development of the Healthy Bodegas Program, Health Bucks Farmers Market Vouchers, policy regulations to require calorie posting at chain restaurants, and nutrition physical activity standards for children's programs. You must have been in New York because they seem to always lead the way, don't they? Um, she holds a master's degree in community nutrition and program evaluation from Cornell University and speaks Spanish fluently, so perhaps we'll get some extra languages here today. Um, so let me start by inviting um, Dr. Pelletier up, and then we will be creative and move from there. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here today. So there's three parts to my presentation today, and I want to start by defining small vendors and describing their role in the WIC program. Next, I will describe state variation in WIC vendor stocking requirements, and this is based on some research that my colleagues and I have conducted at the University of Minnesota. And then I'll wrap up by describing research and policy efforts to establish national minimum stocking guidelines that would affect small vendors, with a particular emphasis on feasibility and implementation. So there's no agreed upon definition of small vendors, but in the WIC context, we typically think of them as retail food stores that are not supermarkets. So this could include convenience stores, corner stores, and small grocery stores, such as those you see here. And the availability of healthy foods varies widely across these vendors. It's important to note that there are also many small vendors that do not participate in the WIC program. And these tend to be even smaller and have even more limited healthy food availability. A common way to characterize uh, small vendors is by the number of cash registers. So vendors with one or two cash registers make up one quarter of WIC authorized vendors nationally. 
I wasn't able to locate any national data on the share of WIC transactions that occur at small vendors, but I did find data from California that found that about 10% of WIC transactions took place at these stores. So despite this small percentage, small food vendors play a very important role in uh, providing food for communities, particularly low-income communities, racially diverse neighborhoods, and rural areas where supermarkets may not be present. And research studies in this area have found that stores typically visit, or consumers typically visit these stores multiple times per week and purchase just a few items at a time. So while the small vendors generally are not replacing the supermarkets for these larger stocking up trips, they do provide valuable and convenient access to food staples between those less frequent supermarket visits. Small vendors face unique challenges stocking and selling healthy foods. And we're going to hear much more about this in the next presentation, so I just want to give a brief overview here. The first challenge is infrastructure. A defining feature of small vendors is their small size, and this limits the amount of space they have available for uh, on the shelves and in the coolers for food. Relatedly, it can be difficult for these vendors to find distribution channels, particularly for perishable foods. Because of their limited infrastructure, small vendors need smaller and more frequent deliveries of foods. And this is not cost effective for most distributors. So as a result, many owners and managers become their own distributors, and they go to large supermarkets and super centers, buy a bunch of fruits and vegetables, and repackage them for sale in smaller sizes in their stores. Third, we've seen in intervention studies that owners and managers of these stores often lack the technical knowledge on how to properly store and display healthy and perishable foods. And this can lead to spoilage and reduced sales. And last, I mentioned that consumers typically aren't buying a lot of food each time they visit these stores. So while the small vendors are being, yours, being used more as a supplemental source of food shopping, customers still expect to see a wide variety of high quality foods on the shelves. I also just want to mention that there's been a lot of great work done by local governments and food advocates across the country that have worked closely with owners and managers of these small stores working on addressing these challenges. And we've seen that those efforts can lead to increased availability and sales of healthy foods, as well as improved consumer knowledge and dietary behaviors. So the challenges that I just described are a major contributor to the high variability that we see in uh, the types and amounts of healthy food that's available in small food vendors. However, all WIC authorized vendors are required to stock minimum quantities of foods and beverages that meet the requirements of the WIC food package. And the purpose of these requirements is to ensure that WIC vendors have enough variety and depth of stock to serve the needs of WIC beneficiaries, and also to create some consistency in what consumers can expect to see when they enter a WIC authorized store, regardless of its size. And we heard earlier that it's a very frustrating experience for beneficiaries when they don't see this consistency. So by most accounts, these regulations have been both feasible and successful. After the 2009 changes to the WIC food package were implemented, there were several studies that found owners and managers of small stores needed some transition time to comply with the new requirements, but there was no evidence that small vendors dropped out of the WIC program because they were unable to meet the new requirements. However, there was a USDA study that found that one third of small WIC vendors had insufficient stock when they were assessed in unannounced visits by data collectors. So despite these feasibility concerns, there's been increasing interest among foundations and multiple levels of government in developing minimum stocking requirements that could apply to all small food stores, not just those that participate in WIC. And this would be a strategy to increase access to healthy foods in communities that don't have ready access to supermarkets. So to inform these efforts, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Healthy Eating Research Program convened an expert panel last year to develop recommendations for minimum stocking levels and marketing strategies for small retail food stores. The panel's goal was to develop stocking levels that would be feasible and would also make a meaningful contribution to healthy food access in communities. The panel reviewed existing guidelines, recommendations, and scientific research to develop their recommendations. And Melissa Laska at the University of Minnesota chaired this panel, and she and I co-authored this report. The panel heavily considered the minimum stocking requirements for WIC authorized stores to inform its recommendations. Now, federal guidelines lay out only very basic requirements, including two varieties of fruits, two varieties of vegetables, and one variety of whole grain cereal. 
it's left up to the states to establish more comprehensive stocking requirements, including depth of stock requirements. And depth of stock requirements are important because without them, a store could meet these federal requirements by stocking one apple, one banana, one onion, one green pepper, and one box of Cheerios, so just five items. So in order to understand what states required their vendors to stock, my colleagues and I at the University of Minnesota extracted the guidelines from each state's WIC program website and we coded the minimum requirements for 11 different food and beverage categories. We're currently preparing an analysis of these requirements for publication in a scientific journal, and I'm excited to share with you some of our preliminary findings today. So on the left here are the food and beverage categories that we included in our study. We did not assess infant foods and formula or WIC eligible nutritional since these did not align with the purposes of our study, which was to inform development of stocking or guidelines that would apply to a wide range of stores and not just WIC stores. So in the interest of time, I'll describe the results from just a few of these categories that we assessed. Starting with fruits and vegetables. So you'll recall that the federal requirements state that vendors must stock at least two varieties of fruit and two varieties of vegetables for a total of four varieties. We found that the median number of varieties required in state regulations was also four, but that there was a wide range of four to 24 varieties. And you'll notice that I included a column here that refers to the number of states that were assessed for each measure. And states differed in the metrics that they used to describe their requirements, so it was not always possible to code every measure for every state. A great example of this is the depth of stock requirements for fruits and vegetables. Some states required a minimum dollar amount, while others required a minimum number of pounds, items, or feet of shelf space. Now these categories are not always mutually exclusive. Some states required both a minimum dollar value for fresh produce and a minimum number of items for canned produce. Most states specified their requirements either in terms of dollars or pounds, with a median of $30 and 18 pounds. And we heard earlier that the cash value vouchers for the fruits and vegetables is probably what's driving the, the dollar value unit here. So in all cases except shelf space, which was only specified in one state, you can see that there's also a very wide range in the minimum required depth of stock across states. We also looked more closely at whether states required vendors to stock fresh, frozen, or canned fruits and vegetables. Now all states are required to offer fresh fruits and vegetables in their uh, food packages, but we found that only 36 states explicitly required vendors to stock fresh fruits and vegetables. In the remaining states, the wording of the requirement was vague, and it was unclear whether fresh fruits and vegetables were required. So this illustrates another inconsistency in the stocking requirements across states. Not only did the states use different metrics, but they also varied with regards to how clearly they worded the requirements. Next, let's look at breakfast cereal, which was the only other category with a federal requirement. Federal regulations required vendors to stock at least one variety of whole grain rich cereal. And once again, we see that the median is right on this mark, with some states going beyond this to require up to six varieties. Many states also specified a requirement for the total varieties of cereal, including both whole grain rich and non whole grain rich cereals. And that often looked like this example from Nebraska. Must carry six varieties of cold cereal, four of which must be whole grain. For depth of stock, only eight states required a minimum number of whole grain rich cereal packages, ranging from one to 12. And states were much more likely to set a depth of stock requirement for the total amount of cereal, which they specified using either the number of packages or the number of ounces. So 40 states required a minimum number of packages with a median of 12, and nine states required a median number of ounces, or minimum number of ounces with a median of 72, which would be six 12 ounce packages. So once again, you can see the very wide range in requirements across states. Now let's move on to whole grains, which includes whole grain rich bread. There's no federal minimum requirement for this or any of the other categories that I'll discuss. So 47 states required vendors to stock either one or two varieties of whole grains. We defined a variety as any single kind of product regardless of form, processing, or package size. So for example, all whole grain rich breads would be considered just one variety, and then other common varieties would be brown rice, corn tortillas, and whole wheat tortillas. So of these states, 34 
requi required one of those varieties to be whole grain rich bread, and 26 required at least one variety other than bread. And we looked at this because stocking different varieties of whole grains is important for vendors who serve different cultural groups that rely on different types of grain staples. For depth of stock, 45 states specified a minimum number of items that vendors must stock. And across all varieties, the median number of items required was six, and that ranged from two to 24. Since many states also specified the required package sizes, we were able to translate their depth of stock requirement into pounds, plus add in two more states that only specified their requirements in pounds. So you can see that the medians and ranges are almost identical between these two measures, and that shows that in most states, one package was required to be about one pound. <coughs> Now let's move on to milk, cheese, and eggs, and these are the products that require refrigeration. I mentioned earlier that by their nature, small vendors are short on space, and refrigerated space can come at a particularly high premium. So I'm gonna focus only on the depth of stock requirements for these products. There was much more consistency across states here in the metrics that were used for the requirements. So at the median, states required vendors to stock 12 gallons of milk, four pounds of cheese, and four dozen eggs. Now, all of the food categories that I've discussed had some outliers, but with these categories in particular, Alaska and the District of Columbia were really off the charts. So I wanna show you what this slide looks like without those two states. Excluding these states, the maximums go down from <clears throat> 46 gallons to 36 gallons of milk, from 47 pounds of cheese down to 12, and from 24 dozen eggs down to 12. So in addition to the variation across states, we also found that there is variation within states in the minimum stocking requirements for vendors. The federal regulations allow states to set different levels of requirements for different types of stores, which states categorize into peer groups. 19 states that are highlighted here in blue take advantage of this flexibility and set different levels of requirements. 14 of these 19 states use some measure of store size to classify into peer groups and they measure this either by the number of cash registers, square footage, or sometimes sales volume. The remaining st states use either store type, whether it's a chain store, franchise, independent, or a commissary vendor, or store location, whether it's in a rural or an urban area. Now I've talked to a few people that work in WIC programs in the Midwest to try to understand why we see this regional pattern in the Midwest and mountain states. And most people, when they look at that, this map, they think about rurality and that these states have a lot of rural areas. But most states are not using store location to classify stores into peer groups. So the jury's still out on this question and we're really not sure why some states are choosing to establish peer groups and others are not. So to summarize, we found large variation both across and within states in the minimum stocking requirements for WIC vendors. So flexibility is a good thing. We want states to be able to set regulations that reflect their own unique needs and contexts. But on the other hand, this variation may contribute to disparities in food access among WIC beneficiaries that live in different states. And it may lead to confusion among store owners that operate in multiple states. So there's something to be said for nationwide minimum standards that ensure a basic level of stocking across all WIC vendors. So moving on now to the proposals for national guidelines. The Healthy Eating Research Expert Panel report that I mentioned earlier sought to do just this, establish some basic national minimums recommendations. So for this report, the panel chose to limit the scope of their recommendations to retail food stores with up to three cash registers and include but not limit to WIC and SNAP authorized vendors. They also set two levels of stocking, basic and preferred out of recognition that stores are starting at different places and they have different business models, sales volume, and logistical challenges that they're facing. So again, flexibility is a good thing and we wanted to work that in. The second set of proposed guidelines are uh, released earlier this year were the US Department of Agriculture's proposed rule for enhancing retailer standards in SNAP. So the 2014 Farm Bill instructed USDA to develop increased minimum stocking requirements for SNAP authorized stores. So now I'd like to walk you through a comparison of these three sets of guidelines. On the left column, we have the median level from the state WIC regulations that I just discussed. 
In the middle, we have the Healthy Eating Research Expert Panel basic level, so the lower level recommendations. And on the right, we have the SNAP proposed rule. And I've collapsed the food categories here into the four categories that are used by SNAP. So first, let's compare WIC and Healthy Eating Research. You'll remember that the WIC regulations use different metrics in different states, so I just selected those states with metrics that we could compare. So at the median, states required WIC vendors to stock four varieties and 18 pounds or 16 items of fruits and vegetables. And healthy eating research recommended 10 varieties and 30 pounds. States required WIC vendors to stock one variety and eight packages of whole grain rich cereal. And healthy eating research recommended three varieties and four packages. The guidelines for other whole grains, including bread, were very similar, two varieties and five or six pounds. The median WIC requirements for dairy included 12 gallons of milk and four pounds of cheese. And in 42 states, at least some of the milk stocked must be low fat or fat free. Healthy eating research recommended five gallons of low fat or fat free milk and two pounds of low fat or fat free cheese. And the two sets of recommendations handled protein sources a little differently. So the WIC program specified separate depth of stock requirements for eggs, peanut butter, canned fish, tofu, and beans and peas. In contrast, Healthy Eating Research recommended that stores stock at least four varieties of protein sources from those that I mentioned, but they did not specify any depth of stock requirements. There are some additional fine points in the Healthy Eating Research Guidelines that I won't go into here, but you should all have a copy of that report, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions on that. Overall, though, we can see the similarities in these two sets of standards, and that was really intentional. But the Healthy Eating Research report recommended greater amounts of fruits and vegetables and lower amounts of dairy. Feasibility was really a primary consideration for healthy eating research, and based on the expert panel's review of the literature and their experience working in small stores, they felt that these levels would be achievable. One important thing to note here is that like WIC, the healthy eating research report specified qualifying standards for the foods in each category that are based on their nutritional content, processing, and package size and to ensure a minimum level of healthfulness for the foods that would be stocked. So now let's take a look at the SNAP rule. In each of the four food categories, the uh, proposed rule would require SNAP vendors to stock seven varieties and six items of each variety for a total of 42 items in each food category. In addition, vendors would have to stock uh, perishable items in at least three out of these four categories. Unlike WIC and healthy eating research, SNAP does not distinguish between whole grains and non-whole grains or between low-fat and full-fat dairy when determining which food products can qualify towards the minimum stocking levels here. So as you can see, there are a lot of key differences between these three sets of guidelines that make them somewhat difficult to compare. The first is that the guidelines use different metrics for measuring depth of stock. Healthy eating research and some WIC programs use pounds, and SNAP and other WIC programs use the number of items or the number of packages. This was one of the most challenging aspects of our study of state WIC re regulations, which was finding a way to summarize these regulations that are using different metrics. Second, the guidelines also differ in their definition of what constitutes a variety. SNAP allows foods such as butter and cream cheese to count as dairy varieties, and non-whole grain bread and white rice to count as grain staple varieties. In contrast, none of these products would, be, would qualify toward WIC or the Healthy Eating Research minimum stock. Along those same lines, um, Healthy Eating Research and WIC specify qualifying standards for foods based on nutritional content and package size, and SNAP does not. However, USDA has proposed disqualifying what they call multiple ingredient foods, such as pizza and frozen dinners, from uh, meeting these minimum stocking levels, though beneficiaries would still be able to use their benefits to purchase those ingredients or those products. Fourth, Healthy Eating Research and WIC in some states set two or more levels of stocking to give different types of stores greater flexibility in meeting the regulations. And in contrast, SNAPS gives vendors flexibility by allowing them to choose the categories of foods in which they will stock perishable items. 
And last, and this was mentioned earlier, healthy eating research coupled their recommendations on minimum stocking levels with recommendations on food marketing strategies that stores can use to increase sales of healthier products. So the expert panel recognized that increasing customer demand is an important complement to increasing the availability of healthy foods in these stores. All of these differences make it difficult to assess whether stores that meet one set of guidelines would meet either of the others. And it's very possible that in some states, stores that meet the WIC minimum stocking requirements would not meet the new proposed SNAP requirements. So where do we go from here? We've seen that small vendors can successfully meet minimum stocking requirements, though they may need technical assistance or loans for infrastructure improvements to get started. Having a strong emphasis on training and technical assistance before implementing changes can help stores and, uh, to make sure that they're ready to comply when the uh, ch requirements change. There's also ongoing research in this area, including a healthy eating research funded feasibility study of the expert panel recommendations. And that study is being led by Allison Carpin at the University of Delaware, and there are participating sites at the University of Minnesota, Arizona State University, and East Carolina University. So ultimately, we're unsure how WIC regulations are being set by the states and what factors they take into consideration when they're establishing their minimum stocking requirements, but we do know that they're varying widely across states. And more comprehensive federal regulations could therefore contribute to providing a minimum level of access for beneficiaries and offer some consistency across WIC programs. And as USDA updates its regulations for SNAP, there may also be opportunities to create some consistency across federal programs in the <laughs> metrics and the definitions that are used to establish vendor requirements. But in the meantime, it will be important to communicate with WIC vendors about the new SNAP regulations and help them understand what they'll need to do to ensure they meet both sets of requirements. So I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Melissa Laska and Leanna Schreiber, and Healthy Eating Research that provided the funding for this study. And I'll leave you with a list of references and my contact information. Thank you.